morning. Welcome to another Church at Home here at Hope for the Nations. Pastor Levi here. So grateful that you would join us today. Let's begin this morning by entering into a time of worship together.
Thank you, guys. This morning, we're continuing on in our series on prayer, and this morning's topic or this morning's subject is a message entitled, A Powerful Praying Church. There's a great um, author, uh, somewhat theologian, uh, lived in the time of the 1800s, um, passed away in the early 1900s. His name was E.M. Bounds, and he, he, he wrote this in one of his books. The secret of success in Christ's kingdom is the ability to pray. The one who can wield the power of prayer is the strong one, the holy one in Christ's kingdom. The most important lesson we can learn is to pray. Someone else once said that wherever prayer is passionate, people are passionate. If you've ever read through the book of Acts, you would soon discover how important prayer was to the early church. Over and over again, as you read through the different stories, the different um, scriptures in the book of Acts, you would see how prayer was so important and vital to not only the beginning of the church, but also sustaining the early church. Acts 1.14 says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Acts 2.42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Acts chapter 3 says, Now Peter and John went up early together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Also in Acts chapter 16, 25, we're, we're, we're able to see Paul and Silas, and they've been imprisoned in jail. And that scripture says that they were found praying and singing hymns to God. Throughout the book of Acts, you would be able to see and find over and over again the church coming together and praying, and results would take place. There's actually 32 times in the scriptures in Acts, you will find the church coming together and praying for different reasons. Personally, I believe that if we want to see lives change and souls saved, we need to be a praying church. If we want Jesus to be able to use us as a body of Christ to impact the communities where we find ourselves in, we need to be a praying church. If we want to see our church become what God designed it to be and making an impact, we need to be a praying church. And that is what we find in our text this morning in the beginnings as we jump into this story in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. So let's read this story, shall we? And it says, And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. You, by the mouth of your servant David, have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants with, that with all boldness they may speak your word, stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. This, to many, is one of the greatest recorded prayers in the Bible. It may com be confusing to you because we kind of jumped in halfway through the story. But what's taking place, middle of Acts chapter 4, is that Peter and John had just returned from being imprisoned by the religious leaders. Something that took place in Acts chapter 3, and we actually kind of read the beginning of that in one of our contacts where we saw uh, Peter and John going up to the, the temple to pray the ninth hour. As they were making their way 
up, they ran into a lame person. Many of you guys may remember the story. The lame man asked for money. Peter says, I ain't got none. And I do have something for you, though. And what actually ended up taking place is he healed the man. He didn't heal him. God healed the man through them. And something took place. People surrounded this great miracle um, inside the temple. And so as they perform the miracle, they start to see the crowds gathering. Um, the Holy Spirit just empowered Peter and he began to preach like the day of Pentecost. Something took place just like Pentecost. 3,000 were saved on Pentecost. Today, it says that 5,000 were added to the church. So the religious leaders saw this. They saw the impact that it made, not necessarily the miracle, but the message. And so they became furious. They took uh, Peter and John and they imprisoned them. And they kind of were yelling at them, got all mad at them, and told them that you cannot tell the message any longer Anywhere. What was the message? The message that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the only way to get to the Father, to heaven, to eternal life. And they did not believe it. They did not like that. So they threatened them and eventually they ended up letting them go. So we jump into the story right after that, that was taking place. And we see that as they left the imprisonment, they didn't just go home and get a good night's sleep. What they actually did is they went and found their companions. They went and found their church family. Something we needed to know and see that's very vital here is that what was taking place was not these two individuals, Peter and John, were not facing all the religious leaders of Jerusalem, the 71 elders and religious leaders that were that were uh, formed in this um uh, this entity called the Sanhedrin. It wasn't just two verses 71. What we actually see taking place is that it was the whole church versus the Sanhedrin versus the religious leaders, that there was actually a spiritual battle that was going on. And that is kind of leads me into my first point this morning. The power of a praying church is being united in prayer. A powerful praying church is united in prayer. Acts 4, 23 through 24 says, And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord. Again, a powerful praying church is united in prayer. Praying together is important as the body of Christ. That it is not meant to be something that's done on the sideline. It's not meant to be something that's irrelevant or a waste of time. It's supposed to be the life source of the church. And we see it over and over throughout the book of Acts. That when anything needed to take place, whenever there was problems, whenever there was persecution, whenever um, something came up, their first response was prayer. And they did it unitedly. That is what we need to do. And we need to take part. If we want to be a powerful praying church here at Hope for the Nations, we need to be united and prayer needs to be our first response. So that's what we need to see, that that, that there was a focus on prayer, that they made time for prayer, that they all were involved in prayer, that we need to be united in prayer and it needs to be our first response. Jesus reinforces this idea as he quotes from the book of Isaiah in the gospel of Mark chapter 11, verse 17. He reads, it says this, and as he taught them, he said, is it not written? My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Jesus calls the house of God a house of prayer. And I know what you might think, and, and I, I've thought it before, because for the most part, when we think of church, we think of preaching and teaching. But he didn't call it a house of preaching and teaching. He didn't call it a house of fellowship. Now, don't get me wrong. All that are needed and all those are a part of what we do in community and fellowship and in preaching and teaching as we come together in church. But first and foremost, we see that Jesus calls his church a house of prayer. And it's Jesus that is building the church. So we need to come into alignment with him, what he has called the church, what he has called the house of God, and that is to be a house of prayer of all for all nations. My question for you this morning, is prayer a priority in your life? Is prayer a priority in our lives as a church family at Hope? 
Are we united in prayer? We haven't been able to give very many updates because of just everything going on with this pandemic going on with COVID-19. We've been wanting to start and as, as we kind of have been praying and, and planning to open and start, things came to kind of fall back in line. We thought we were in phase 1.5 and actually we're still in, in phase one. We wanted to open um, to be able to come inside the building and then we found out that we couldn't. So we have been in prayer and what our plans are, just to give you a heads up, what we're planning on is the beginning of August, no matter what is taking place, whether we're still only able to meet outside or we're going to be able to come inside. I know that Governor Inslee for us for Washington is going to have an update July 28th. So no matter what happens, whether if it's we're still kind of where we're at or if we're moving to another phase, we are going to begin to have church meetings together again. And with that, we are going to actually open up our prayer time again. We were having prayer times on Saturday night, the night before prayer, um, from 6 to 7, I believe. Actually, yeah, from 6 to 7. Well, now we are going to be having our prayer times move to Thursday night so that other people can come so that you can come and make time. Because I know Saturday night is kind of tough to be able to make that. So we are going to get you more information in the weeks to come. But we see the importance of united prayer. And we have been going through this series on prayer. And we want to make sure that we have um, just the ability and the availability for all of us to gather together and be able to come on Thursday nights and be united in prayer and to be able to be a powerful praying church. So I just want to encourage you that no matter what is going on, that we are going to be meeting in the beginning of August. And what that looks like right now, we still don't know whether it's going to be inside with a certain capacity or whether it's going to be out in our lawn here at 606 or our building at 603 outdoors on Sunday mornings, but we also will be having prayer meeting taking place on Thursday nights, whether it be out in the lawn or inside here, inside the building. So I just wanted to encourage you with that, let you know that that is our update because we want to be a powerful praying church. Amen. We want to be united in prayer. We want, we want prayer to be our first response and we want to be able to continue to, to come in and see prayer a center of this church because we know that Jesus is building this church. Amen. And Jesus calls this house, this church, a house of prayer. And that is what we want to be first and foremost. Amen. So we see that a powerful praying church is united in prayer. Next, a powerful praying church is God centered in prayer. Acts 4, 24 says, so when they heard that they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. So what we see is their first response was to pray. They prayed unitedly. Um, they prayed in one accord. And as they prayed, the focal point was on God. Know that powerful prayer is centered first on God. God. The first thing they do when they heard the stories going on, the persecutions that took place with, with Peter and John, is they came unitedly, they came together in prayer, and as they prayed out all together, their focus, their center was on God. They weren't focused on the problems. They weren't focused on the circumstances. They weren't focused on the threats. First and foremost, they were focused on God in prayer. And I think that is important for each and every one of us, that we need to recognize God in the midst of our circumstances, that we need to recognize God is present in the present, that his presence is here in the present, that he's with me, that he's with you, that he's with us. And we need to recognize that before we get into any further into prayer, because what often can take place is when we pray, we pray for me. We pray me-centered prayers. We pray problem-centered prayer. We pray circumstance circumstance-centered prayer. And what we need to be, if we want to be a powerful praying church, we need to pray God-centered prayer. Realigning our mindset, realigning our emotions, realigning our thoughts 
solely on God and being able to focus on him and the problems. And I know for me, that can be tough because I want the problem to be gone. I want all the issues to be gone. But first and foremost for us, we need to recognize, we need to realize that God is present with us, that his presence is present in our problems, no matter what we're going through. So is God the center of your prayer? When you come into prayer, when we're gathered in a time of prayer, maybe in your homes with your family, maybe even in your personal prayer time, is God the center of your prayer or are you the center of your prayer? God is not some some old wise grandpa. He's not Santa Claus up in the sky just waiting to give you gifts. He's not just some distant power that's kind of out of touch with reality. No, he is the creator of all things and everything in the earth. That he is the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He knows the end from the beginning. That he is all powerful, all knowing, and nothing can hinder him. Nothing can come against him. Because he is God and he's God all by himself. And we need to realize that because oftentimes when we come into prayer, we come with a defeated mindset. We come like we've already lost. But if we are believers in Christ Jesus, God has already gained the victory through the death, resurrection, the, 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 the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension into heaven as he, and he has empowered us with the Holy Spirit to live victoriously. Amen. I'm talking too fast for myself here because I'm getting excited. I hope you're getting excited because we're victorious, amen, that we are overcomers in Christ Jesus. And we need to realize that. And when we come into prayer, it can no longer be me focused. It can no longer be problem focused. It needs to be God focused, God centered prayer. Because when we focus on the problems, when we focus on, on ourselves, on the circumstances, there's actually a lack of faith. And when there's lack of faith, Fear can creep in and it can paralyze us. And fear is that number one problem with believers walking in the power of God, walking in his plans and purposes. And it actually takes our focus off of God. And we look more at our problems. We look more at our circumstances. But we are people of faith. Amen. And being people of faith, we need to pray God-centered prayers and believe that God is present, that he's with us, that he's for us, and that he is in control. No matter what's going on, no matter what's going on with your marriage, no matter what's going on financially, no matter what's going on with your children, no matter what's going on with this pandemic, that God is in control. He didn't wake up one morning and figure out what is going on. He already knew the end from the beginning. And he takes care of his beloved. Amen. And we need to pray prayers that are God-centered prayers. So we see powerful praying church prays in unity. It prays God-centered prayer. Next thing we see about a powerful praying church is they prayed scripture. They prayed scriptures. Acts 4, 24 through 26 says, So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Verse 25, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. A powerful praying church prays scripture. What what we need to know right here is that they're not just saying something out of the blue, what they're actually doing is they're actually quoting scripture from the Old Testament. They're quoting a psalm, it is Psalm chapter two, it's a psalm of David, where David had just become king, and instead of him being able becoming king, everyone submitting to him, even everyone from the outside, all these other nations. Instead, there was people that were trying to come up. People were plotting um, to, to defeat him, rebel against him, uh, and, and trying to come against David, trying to come against the plans of God, trying to come against his anointed one, which at the time was King David here as the king of Israel. But what takes place 
it, it, so that's kind of like the short-sighted view and the context of that scripture. But what we see here is that the church saw that as a prophetic word for them. They saw this scripture, and scripture is God to breathe. It's alive and active and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And as the Holy Spirit breathed upon, uh, upon scripture, he highlighted Psalms chapter 2 and these very verses, and they prayed these prophetic words out in their prayer and that's what we need to realize that that they saw that this word of God that happened hundreds of years before was actually taking place again right there because what was taking place there was there was threats that were coming against God's plans there were threats that were coming against the, the church um right then the early church which was the plan of God they were coming against the anointed one they were coming against the Christ king of Jesus and they realized that taking place we need to know as believers as we read the word of God that it's not just some text it's not just some book that has a lot of cool stories no it is alive and it's active and the Holy Spirit breathed upon it and as we read and study it that he can breathe upon something that took place of old and breathe and speak into our present circumstance. He can use it to speak into something that is going on, problems that are taking place, uh, offenses that are going on, threats that are that are being mounted up against you, persecutions that are taking place, and we can use those to war against the enemy. Amen. If you were able to listen last week, I had my, my father-in-law, Dave, I almost called him Pastor Dave. You remember, he's not a pastor. He is, but he's not. Anyways, my father-in-law, Dave, shared one of the scriptures that he meditates on frequently, Ephesians chapter 6. And in that text, you find out that, that Paul is writing to the Ephesians, and he's talking about the whole armor of God. And Dave mentioned that, that that is one of the things that he meditates upon, how the word of God Paul mentions as the sword of the spirit. It's the offensive weapon that God has given us to war against spiritual battle, to war against the enemies going on around us in spiritual places. And we need to know how to use our offensive weapon. We need to know how to use our sword. And it takes knowing, relying upon God's word. That's what we see here in this powerful prayer by the early church. They were united in prayer. They were God-centered in prayer. And they used scripture. They used scripture to war against the enemy. They used scripture to be able to pray and prophesy into their present circumstances. We as believers, we need to know the word of God that we can use it to prophesy and use it as a spiritual weapon in our lives. See that it applies to our lives today, that it can direct us, that it can bring life, that it can help us to decide what is right what it, from what is wrong, that it helps us to divide from, from our soulish uh, thinking and, and the spiritual realm and what God wants us to do in the spirit. And we need to know that this, this is our weapon. That this is our weapon and we need to know it. We need to spend time in it. If we want to be a powerful praying church, we need to know God's word. We need to be in God's word. Amen. So that is what we see, that we want to be a powerful praying church. We want to be united in prayer. Amen. And our prayer here at Hope for the Nations is as we begin to meet back together again, that we would be able to join in prayer in unity. And as we do, we want to be praying God-centered prayers. Amen. We don't want to just focus on problems, focus on the pandemic, focus on what's going on in our world or in our lives. We want to be focused on God because when we're focused on him, the answers come from that. Amen. And we want to know scripture so that we can pray scripture, that we can use it as a prophetic weapon to fight against different things going on in our lives. Amen. Finally, a powerful praying church believes in a powerful God. A powerful praying church believes in a powerful God. Acts chapter 4, verse 29 through 30 says, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Again, a powerful praying church believes in a powerful God. And I think it's interesting to notice what they didn't ask for from God. They didn't ask him to do. In the face of opposition, 
They didn't ask for protection. They didn't ask for relief. They didn't ask for uh, to be rescued. And I think primarily that's kind of our first response, right? When we come in prayer, we ask God, get me out of this mess. God, just, just, just end this circumstance. Um, make it go away. Get rid of them in my life. That is predominantly, I think, sometimes our prayer. That's what we ask for. But that is not what they prayed. Because powerful prayer takes believing in, in a powerful God. They didn't ask for the circumstances to go away. They didn't ask for the people to be, to, to, to be quiet. They asked for boldness to be able to face the persecution. They asked for his power and enablement and, and to be equipped to be able to continue to stand up and to declare the message of God. That they didn't ask God for escape, but they asked for enablement. They didn't ask for protection. They asked for power. And I think that is something that we need to realize as the people of God, that it's not necessarily God get rid of the circumstance, but God, you are in the midst of the circumstance. God, you can change me in the midst of the circumstance and you can empower me and enable me to face the circumstance. That is powerful prayer. And that is a prayer that, that, it, that is prayed powerfully in the church. And that is what my hope and my prayer for us is because this Context of prayer is a powerful prayer that we see the church coming together. We see it being united. We see it God centered. We see it focused on scripture and praying scripture out and believing in a powerful God that makes it this powerful prayer. But there's one other reason why this is a powerful prayer and that many people believe it's a powerful prayer, something to be modeled and followed after. And that is because it's a powerful prayer that sees powerful results. It's a powerful prayer that sees powerful results. Acts 4.31 says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. I know for many, we think, well, it's not really been maybe our experience to see the miraculous take place. And there may be some still in our church that don't believe really that 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 doesn't take place for today, that God only did that in the Bible. But there's no reason for that because God is still the same God. And his power is still the same power. And the name of Jesus is still the name that is above all name and has the power unto salvation. So we as a church body can need to continue to believe in a powerful God to be able to release powerful prayers and believe that powerful prayers will lead us to powerful results. That we can be a, a church body that believes again that God wants to stretch out his hand, that God wants to bring healing, that God wants to bring miraculous signs and wonders and taking place. What would happen if we as Hope for the Nations would be an epicenter of God healing those around us, of God being able to heal those, deliver those from alcoholism, being able to see the homeless that we've been ministering to for, for eight plus years find Christ and see the native culture change and shift in our lifetime, what would it look like for the, the, the house of God to be a house of prayer that we would be able to come together, united in prayer, being focused on God, praying and prophesying scripture and seeing God come in the midst of it, that we would be able to speak boldly, that we would be a bold witness to see salvations taking place in the valley and beyond. What we see is that the place was shaken. It happened then, why not now? They were all filled with the Spirit again. It happened then, why not now? They had new supernatural boldness and courage to speak the Word of God. It happened then, why not now? Why can't God do the same that He did back in Acts in the early church here at Hope for the Nations? I believe He can. And I believe that we need to continue to come together, united, praying God-centered prayers, speaking the word of God with the boldness, praying it out prophetically in our prayers together, believing that God is powerful. 
knowing that it's his will to heal and deliver and save and believing that we're actually going to see results when we pray. That is the power of a praying church. And I want to close with one other scripture. If you frequently come to our church, you would see this in a picture frame as you come through the front doors of our church. On the right-hand side, it's Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. It happened then. Why not now? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're good. We thank you that you're loving, that you're kind, that you're compassionate to generations. We thank you for your love that's been displayed extravagantly through the giving of your son, his life, death, burial, and resurrection and ascension, and through the giving of Holy Spirit into us as believers. And we come before you boldly into your throne room and ask, Lord, for forgiveness. We ask for mercy. We ask that you would empower us once again and enable us and fill us with Holy Spirit to overflowing and that you would use us mightily to be able to reach this generation, this community and beyond for your kingdom, Lord, for your glory. We thank you that you're good and we are crazy enough to believe you for what you've said. Believe your word, that it doesn't return void, but that it sets out and accomplish what it was sent out for, Lord. That we know that you're still present. We know that you're still powerful. We know that you're still with us, Lord. So we ask, Lord, that you would stretch out your hand to heal. That you would continue to perform signs and wonders. That we would be able to be used as your messengers to boldly declare your word in this generation. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys.